In the cold morning of the Libyan desert, Pascal Lutubu takes a break before a long day on the road. Like all the men of his tribe, he knows this sea of sand like the back of his hand. Essential for doing his job. Pascal is an immigrant smuggler. Every week, he drives illegal immigrants who come from all over Africa upwards, as he says, towards the Mediterranean. Tomorrow morning, Pascal and his assistant have two Cameroonians to transport. A perilous journey that is best to prepare in advance. The car must be in perfect condition. Breaking down in the desert is out of the question. To ward off bad luck, Pascal has a lucky charm. And for morale, two bottles of gin. But the most important thing is to be well armed. Since the revolution, the Libyan government has been struggling to regain control of his country. You have to be able to defend yourself against highway bandits, which the desert is teeming with. These are rockets. They're to ensure your and the traveler's safety. Pascal lives in the southernmost city of Libya, Merzik, an oasis of 20,000 inhabitants. Since the death of Gaddafi in 2011, Libya has become the main corridor for illegal immigration. Hundreds of illegal Africans wind up in its streets. Merzik is a stopover city. Illegals stop there to regain their financial strength. Here, they earn a few hundred dollars, which is enough to pay for the rest of their trip to Europe. This is the exact journey of Pascal's two customers. Today is the big day. The smuggler's assistant comes to wake them up. Emile, 19 years old, doesn't have a degree and left his country at the age of 16. Elia, 24, is a professional footballer. Both are going to risk their lives for a dream to reach France at all costs. The dangerous expedition began in 2010. Both left their native country, Cameroon, before going through Chad, where they met. Moving on slowly over three years to finally wind up in Merzik where they became masons to pay for the rest of their trip. In France, Elia intends to go back to being the great athlete that he was in his own country. In Cameroon, I was a footballer. I played in the first division. That's what's driving me to get to Europe. We had to find a way for me to get out of the country, you know, the visa problems in Cameroon, especially for France, it's not very easy. My wish is to be in showbiz, show business. It's what I love the most in the world. After his high school diploma, Emil did an internship in Cameroonian television. Succeeding in showbiz in France has become an obsession. When he talks about Paris, he has stars in his eyes. I see France most often on TV. Tall buildings, the Champs-Élysées. People are free to express themselves how they want, to go for walks when they want. There is work, there is everything I want. That's what France has, so I really want to go there. After two years in Merzik, both their lives boil down to this simple suitcase. We share the same suitcase. We travel as fighters, as we always have, right from the start. We have two or three pieces of clothing for the road. Yes. Come on, let's go. That morning, they are smiling, but their dream has suddenly become terrifying. They're about to face 2,000 kilometers. First the desert, then the Mediterranean Sea that they'll have to cross on a makeshift boat. Come on, we have to go, get in. Pascal's assistant takes a back seat. I pray that God brings me peace and keeps us safe. May I stay in good health and come back in good health, and for you too. You'll have to get out if there are any problems. The long journey gets off to a flying start because Pascal, the smuggler, is a bit tipsy. He doesn't hold back on the accelerator.
The two Cameroonians remain confident. We are happy to leave, but we are also sad to leave the rest of our companions who we spent time with. There is pride, but it is also mixed with some sadness. With a lump in his throat, Elia records a final message that the assistant will give to his friends who stayed in Merzik. Whenever you have a problem, an unhappy or unfortunate event, you can count on us. We are your brothers. Only the sea separates us and I hope that very soon we will see each other again. May God keep us. We are always together. To reach Paris, the two young Cameroonians are going to take huge risks. Like Emile and Ellie, almost 150,000 people every year hope to cross borders illegally to reach what they believe to be the American dream of Europe. Alone or with family, they are ready to risk it all to get there, even if it means losing their lives. They come from Africa and the East. For the first time, television cameras followed the incredible journey of these migrants for a year. With Emil and his companions, we crossed the deserts, crossed the Mediterranean on a makeshift boat in a hold and in human conditions, like the slaves of the past. It's hell, even worse than hell. With Javid, Luckman and their Afghan friends, we climbed mountains and crossed forbidden borders, encountered merciless smugglers, braved the cold, hunger, and thirst. How many mountains are there left to cross? All that. All that. Not all of them will reach France. This is their remarkable story. In the car that takes Ellie and Emile towards the Mediterranean, it's a surprising mix with music, alcohol, and the pedal to the metal which carries them at 110 miles per hour. <laughs> That's when Gay Musica, a band from Africa. Let's go. 180 kilometers per hour. All of a sudden, Pascal leaves the highway. Tarmac, as they say in Africa. He follows trails that only men in the desert know. Without him, death would be certain. Besides, this knowledge is what earns him his reputation, but also his price. For each passenger, he pockets $550. That's five times the average Libyan salary. For Elia and Emil, the sum is huge, but it's the assurance of never running into a police patrol. When you get arrested, it's not easy. Sometimes you have to pay, sometimes you get put in prison. Are you afraid they'll catch you? Yes, of course. Torture is not easy. It took them eight hours to travel the 150 kilometers of desert between Merzik and Sava. The first leg of their journey. Here, they are going to pick up another candidate for Europe. Their friend, who is also Cameroonian. Siba marks the limit of Pascal's territory. Now, another branch takes them on. But not everything will go as planned. The city of Siba is not completely peaceful. It is in the midst of violent fighting between militias. The smuggler who was supposed to pick them up is not there. Elia is worried. It reminds him of the struggles during his first trip to Libya. We finally arrived. And we waited for the Libyan smuggler for almost a month and a half. Six weeks, so we're waiting again. Emile is devastated. The owner of the premises puts them up in his garage. In the meantime, Joseph, the friend who is going with them to Europe, 
has just arrived in a taxi. Hello? How are you? I'm really good. Joseph is also a Mason. He moved to Siba three years ago. Today, he is attempting this impossible journey because of the deadly fighting ravaging the city of Siba. I told my friends that I have an opportunity to leave this place. The country is unstable. Things are changing. Every day there are disturbances here, gunshots there. So it's best for me to go to protect my life and get out of here because things are getting worse by the day. So even where were you? I went to buy food so they can eat something. No one has eaten since this morning. Bread, Pepsi. Before leaving, one of Pascal's men went to buy dinner. He assures the undocumented that they will hit the road again without fail tomorrow morning. Despite the delay, everything seems well organized. The fighting did not calm down during the night. On the contrary, it got even more intense. To make matters worse, the temperature dropped touching on 32 degrees. The immigrants have a heater and a few blankets. A few hours later, the power went out. I'm so cold, it's so cold, look at my feet. I kept my shoes on but it didn't make a difference, it's so cold. The heating went off because of a power cut. The house is in the middle of the desert, this is ridiculous. There are holes in the walls. You're constantly waking up because you're so cold. The next morning, the Cameroonians are at a loss. Still no trace of the smuggler and Eliev begins to seriously doubt whether he's coming at all. I really don't know what's going on. I don't think this smuggler even exists. This smuggler we've been told about. Continuing the trip alone is far too dangerous. They have no choice but to wait. The owner of the premises agrees to host them, but on one condition. From the door to here, I want to close it off, 10 meters. He wants them to build a wall for a non-negotiable salary, $20 each. Emil has a different take on it. He doesn't care for the poor salary. For him, it's slavery. I'm done working with the Libyans. You won't work now? No, 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 no. Really? Yes. Why is that? They've already mistreated us as it is. I want him to pretend, even if he doesn't want to work, he should pretend. It's a small job compared to what we've already gone through. It cost a lot of money to get here. You work on a construction site for two months, then they whip out the Kalashnikov and they tell you to take a hike. So he should pretend to work. Reluctantly, he goes to work. At this moment, Emil, Elia, and Joseph's morale is at an all-time low. How can they continue the trip without a smuggler? The challenge ahead of them is huge. On the other side of the world, a new day is dawning in Kabul, Afghanistan. Kabul, three million inhabitants who are mostly displaced farmers exhausted by 30 years of war. Among them are two cousins, candidates for a trip to Europe, Javid in white and Roni in gray. Like them, 10,000 young Afghans are trying their luck in Europe every year. In Asia, they are the most likely to emigrate to Paris or London. Javid and his cousin Roni are forced to leave Afghanistan. They tell us that in their region, it is the Taliban who make the law. And for opposing one of their decisions, their heads were set at a price. I want to go to Europe. Here, I am in danger. I have problems in my province with the Taliban, and I can't go back there anymore. So, 
I am hiding here in Kabul. I am afraid because the Taliban can reach me, even here in the middle of town. Sons of wealthy farmers, Javid and Rouhani seem to have the means to buy a plane ticket to Paris. But for an Afghan, obtaining a European visa is almost impossible. Their only option is to flee the country illegally. This morning, they have an appointment with the head of the smugglers' network. Other future illegal immigrants are also present. For my part, I will take you on a fairly quiet road. Unlike other smugglers, I provide bread, food, and clothing. You will go from smuggler to smuggler along the way. I will stay in contact with them. They will bring you safely to Greece with no problem. Unlike in Africa, Afghan smugglers organize everything from departure to arrival, like a travel agency. Once the money is pocketed, they have an obligation to perform except on two points. What happens if you get robbed or kidnapped? If you die or get sick, I am not responsible. So for the trip, you'll pay me $7,000. Come on, do a good deed. Do it for $6,500. Okay, $6,500. But if you go with another smuggler along the way, I don't do refunds. Even with this rebate, $6,500 is a considerable amount when you know that the average salary in Kabul does not exceed $110. Most illegal immigrants borrow money to leave. Both cousins are lucky. Their families pay for part of the trip, but that's not enough. Javid is forced to sell his car. And how much is it worth on the market? It's priced at $4,500, I think. The deal is done. With this sale, the two cousins will pay the $2,000 deposit set by the smuggler. The rest of the money will be paid by their family as they go as they get closer to Europe. Security is essential to avoiding being ripped off by the network. Before leaving Kabul, their final pleasure is to go to their barber. Afghans like to look good no matter the circumstances. Both are single. Apart from their families, nothing is keeping them in Kabul, a city they hope to never see again. There's our capital. I will not be coming back. Paris is over there, and it's clean. There is no dust. Here, there aren't even any trees. We definitely won't miss Kabul. I don't know how our trip is going to go. It will be dangerous. We'll have to walk. We're going to cross forests, mountains. It's going to be very difficult. The next morning, the great journey to Paris begins. As the smuggler promised, everything is well organized. A comfortable minivan has been chartered. Inside, 30 men pose as tourists. The trip got off to a pretty pleasant start, but it's all an illusion. Their adventure is going to get complicated. They will travel on foot, by car, and by boat across 7,000 kilometers through Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and finally, Greece. On the road, they pass two American tanks. The last images of the war and the nightmare for Javid and Rahani. Americans are dirty and mean. They block the roads under the pretext that there's a bomb, but in reality, there are none. All they're doing is getting in our way. Three hours later, a line of several kilometers of trucks warn of the border with Pakistan. Everyone is waiting to pass the checks. The place is controversial and closely monitored. It is the crossing point for all trafficking. It's a nest of spies. Here the Pakistani and Afghan secret services intersect as well as the CIA, looking for jihadists and the Taliban. Javid and Rouhani cross the border on foot. We film them discreetly. It will be the only border that they will cross without stress. There is no need for a passport for Afghans heading into Pakistan. Mm -hmm. 
In three days, the small group of illegal immigrants traveled nearly 1,000 kilometers by bus to reach Lahore, which is the final leg before confronting the huge Iranian mountains. Even if well organized, these illegal trips are never made in one go. Sometimes they have to wait for days or months in a dark cage with no comfort. This time it is not the case. In Lahore, the Pakistani smuggler is able to hide them in town. Inside, the community is organized. Each has a very specific function. Household chores don't stop them from dreaming. They all have a very poetic vision of France. In Paris, they spray the city with perfume. That's what I was told. You have to close your eyes. If you look up, it hits you in the face. At the beginning, it will be tough in Paris. Yes, it's always tough when you change cultures. And above all, it's going to be really complicated to learn equality. <laughs> they're laughing, but there's one thing they're afraid of, crossing Iran on foot. Faud was a truck driver. His problems started the day his company started working for Americans. Considered a traitor by the Taliban, he decided to flee to Europe. Faud has already attempted the trip, but he failed. He was arrested in Iran and was deported. So he is the only one who knows what awaits them in the mountains. Faud, tell me, you've already been to Iran. Is the road so difficult? Yes, it is very hard. How likely are we to get there? About a 5% chance, no more. You have no idea how hard it is. It makes me laugh when I see you so optimistic. You think it's just going to be a walk in the park? Is that really what you think? The tour package continues. After the apartment, the smuggler bought them train tickets to the Iranian border. Javed and Fawad look more like tourists than illegal immigrants. In the group, some are not fleeing the Taliban, but the blood feuds that are wreaking havoc in the country. Young Luckman joined the group in Lahore. Part of his family was wiped out, including his own father. All that for a few hectares of land. For us, the journey stops at the border. Entering Iran illegally as journalists is risking being mistaken for spies, which is a very serious charge that leads straight to prison. We leave Luckman and his friends with a small camera. They will film this part of the journey themselves. From that moment on, the trip takes a different turn. A pickup has replaced the minivan, but the atmosphere is still light. I'm dying. There are 30 of us sitting in this truck, and three of them are sitting on my leg. <laughs> 30 people, 36 even. Packed into this truck, they are not yet aware of what awaits them. They filmed this epic from start to finish across the mountains of Balochistan and its dozens of calls at more than 3,000 meters, particularly the merciless Makran Desert. Over 2,000 kilometers across Iran to reach Urmia at the Turkish border. All this while carefully avoiding villages and police patrols. Raber, how is it going? Yes, I'm good. We're just getting started. May God protect us. There are a lot of us here. More than 100 even. 160 to be exact. It is no coincidence that there are so many illegal immigrants. To make the trip profitable, several networks are grouped together. This way, they can share food and sleeping places. We have to climb this mountain. Have you seen how many of us there are? The first ascent quickly gives them an idea of the effort needed for the coming days. Come on guys, keep moving forward, keep moving.
I'm so tired. Exhausted. We've been walking for five hours. Come on, hurry up. Keep going or we're going to be late. Javid catches sight of Summit. He firmly believes that Iran is on the other side. For all migrants, the shock will be brutal. How many mountains are there left to cross? All that. All that. Fawad, are we still in Pakistan or already in Iran? In Pakistan. Is that still Pakistan down there? Up until there, it's Pakistan. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Up until there. Come on. And then it's Iran? Yes. After two days of exhausting hiking, here they are finally in Iran. The only thing indicating the border is the license plate on this old truck. Here come the food provisions. Running out of food, Afghans are reassured, but it's bittersweet. Contrary to what their smuggler promised, they have to pay for everything and the prices aren't cheap. The 160 illegal immigrants have no choice. This extortion won't be the last of the trip. The migrant group moves along Bandar Abbas, very close to the Persian Gulf. But they will never see the sea. They only cross deep gorges, white hot from the sun, an open air oven. On the hottest days, the temperature can reach 47 degrees. Luckman, the youngest of the Afghans, is beginning to regret leaving his country. This sunshine, it is unbearable. Is this sun is killing us. This walk will continue. And we're going hour, to continue like this, day and night. And no wage for eating. At least 18 hours without and stopping. Anything. Even for. No time to eat, drink, or even urinate. Day in one night. Our walk is it's a really long walk. Very long walk. He is not the only one complaining. A Pakistani migrant is also very angry with the smugglers. Hmm. How is the trip going? It's a whole mess. Those bastard smugglers. They assured us that we would walk for a maximum of one hour. But now, we've been wandering for eight hours and unfortunately, it is still not over. We will never see the smugglers. They do not allow themselves to be filmed and they lead the trek at military pace. Too bad for stragglers like Javid and Fawad. However, leaving the group also means risking your life. We have to hurry and stay in the middle of the group. Besides, night is coming and that's not good. There are thieves. I think there are some. They usually steal money or bags, and even shoes. Even shoes. Javid, Fawad, and Luckman have reached a point of no return. Lost in the middle of nowhere, it is impossible for them to turn back. Now, they have to look straight ahead to the Turkish border, more than 1,500 kilometers away. In Libya, morale is at an all-time low for the three Cameroonians. The smuggler is still not there, and the wall they are building to pay their stay is almost finished. The owner may decide to kick them out. So Joseph will take their destiny into his own hands. Yes, hello. How is the morning going? It's going fine. Okay, are you at work? Joseph has connections. Several friends of his have already organized crossings. 
People are killing each other here. I can't stay here. Can't stay. Understand? After dozens of phone calls and hours of prayer, God, hear us this morning. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The miracle has finally come. Hello? Joseph has found a new smuggler. The man promises to take them safely all the way to the sea. So the departure is tonight? Yes, tonight. No problem. Once again, they pack a single suitcase. And before leaving, the owner of the premises gives them their salary, 160 Libyan dinar, the $20 promised for each of them. But there is a problem. The new smugglers refuse to be accompanied by journalists. They cannot run the risk of mixing us with you. So they decided to take our vehicle. And you, you will find your own means of transport and a way to get to Tripoli. The three of us will make our own way. So we go by the main road to wait for them in Tripoli, the Libyan capital, 700 kilometers further north. They are going to take a different way. Once again, they go through the desert and side roads in old pickups, but also on foot. Then, it gets out of hand. The smugglers are more like torturers. The Cameroonian suffering will last for six days instead of the promised two. We followed up on their ordeal by phone. How many smuggler changes and legs have you done since Siba? We're on the fifth now, waiting for the sixth. You've changed smugglers five times? Yes. We're making our way through deserts and fields. We get dropped off in one place, another smuggler comes. So now, how many kilometers are you from Tripoli? 650 kilometers according to the last smuggler. So you've barely done 100 kilometers? That's right. The smugglers abuse them. And when they dare to complain. Sometimes they beat us. Joseph was the last one with the bag, but they threw it away. So you have no more stuff? We have nothing left. No underwear, no toothbrush, nothing. Did they steal it from you? Yeah, they took it all. What about the money you earned in Siba? Yeah, they took the money we earned too. But where did they find it? They searched us all over, even in our underwear. A week later, we met up with them again in Tripoli. They were taken in by the Cameroonian community. They'd lost weight. They looked like ghosts. Here is their story. We are tired. Was it really hard? Yeah, really hard. That's not how we imagined it anyway. We thought we'd be on the road for two days max. Maybe three, but not up to six. Everything we endured, it was torture. It really was torture. It was hell. Worse than hell. All my life, I've never lived anything so tough. I've never seen such awful things. There were people crying, big guys, dads in floods of tears. Then when you start crying, they come with the stick above the cover, they hit you hard with a stick this big. They called us slaves, saying, shut up, quiet, slaves. At some point we arrived. He parked us somewhere. No food, no water. I take out my Bible to pray in peace. He sees me with the Bible. He says, What are you doing, slave? He comes, beats me, snatches my Bible and throws it away. The weaker are abandoned purely and simply in the desert. 
This is what happened to these migrants who met their deaths on the border between Libya and Algeria. For Emil, this trip will remain ingrained forever in his memory. He helped an exhausted man walk, then carried him for nearly two kilometers. But at some point he couldn't even talk, he was just saying help me. The guy fell, I'm lifting him up, he weighed more than me. I put my hand on the guy's neck, his pulse was gone, I put my hand on his heart and it had stopped beating. I told the Arab that the guy was dead and he said, if he's dead, throw him on the ground. I said, no, I can't just throw him away. Even if he's dead, we have to respect him. He said, if you don't want to leave him. Then he put his gun to my head. I told him, I can't. He started to hit me with the gun. He was spitting at me. They carried him away and left him. I don't know what they did with him. I have no idea what they did to him. But after all this suffering, a reward. The Mediterranean at last. It's so blue. It's so beautiful. The color of the sky. God's work is wonderful. That's the last leg. Their final challenge is ahead of them. On the other side lies Europe. All that's left is to cross this sea. It's been almost three years since they left Cameroon behind. Each of them starts dreaming. Joseph reckons he has gold in his hands. He is sure that his talent will work wonders in France. People say that I am a genius at decorating. I can become a decoration artist, you never know. Despite only being 19 years old, Emil has wiser dreams. My dream is to succeed in having a house, children, a wife. I know that in Europe, it's hard for undocumented immigrants. But I also know that there are others who arrived without papers and now they have them, so why not me? For Ilya, this trip is a satisfaction. He mainly embarked upon it to prove himself. There were a lot of people in my family who didn't believe in me. I did everything I could to let them know that maybe my success was waiting for me on the other side of the Mediterranean. I know that I am strong both physically and mentally. In Europe, there are a lot of opportunities because I tell myself that the chances I didn't have in Africa, in Cameroon more specifically, may be on the other side, I could find them there. For them, it is the final stage before Paris. However, their problems are far from over. Crossing the Mediterranean is expensive, even on a makeshift boat. And now, they are financially ruined. The smugglers took all their savings from them. They will have to work on construction sites in Zawara. It's January, and we'll see them again in five months. At the port of Zuara, 100 kilometers from Tripoli, is where the majority of illegal boats leave from. Summer and winter alike, the city is teeming with illegal immigrants. Not everyone will survive the crossing to the Italian island of Lampedusa. 250 kilometers of sea are crossed on fishing boats like this one. Designed for a few sailors, smugglers pile in hundreds of immigrants in order to make a maximum profit. Every week, soldiers on the beaches of Zuara gather the bodies of the tormented victims washed up by the sea. Where did you find it? There, on the beach. They are Africans leaving for Europe. They fall into the water and wash up here. The day before yesterday, I found five bodies here. Today, a little boy, he wasn't even. Barely six or seven years old. Five months later, Emile, Joseph and Elia have earned enough money to cross the Mediterranean. They call us. 
We meet them on their latest construction site. We are almost at the end, so we're okay. We're trying to work as much as possible, because it's not just the boat to Lampedusa, we also need some pocket money. In Zawara, there is nothing easier than finding smugglers. They're on every corner. They're often the ones soliciting the migrants. Joseph and Ellie meet with one of them. They will negotiate their passage, but also ours. We're filming the encounter on a hidden camera. The smuggler is the man with his back turned, with the hat and the pink phone. I have friends who want to cross, they called yesterday. They are looking for the right channel to pass. Yeah, there are five of us. Three Cameroonians, plus us. How much can you afford? 600, 800 dollars. Okay, I'll think about it. Give me your number. After several days of negotiations, they finally agree on a price. It will be $900 per journalist and $600 per Cameroonian. It's Alibaba's cave. Now we're digging up our savings. We leave tomorrow. I'm digging out Emil's and my money. The savings we set aside for the trip. Two thousand three hundred and forty-five dinar, one thousand five hundred dollars. This money is the sweat of my brow. I worked hard, so I deserve this. I deserve even more. We worked hard and weren't compensated for all we suffered here. It's still reassuring because it'll pay our transport to Italy. I've never been on a boat. This is the first time. Aren't you very scared? Yes, I am, but not too much. The fear of a shipwreck is on everyone's mind especially since they don't know which boat they are going to travel on. Some crossings are made on cockle shells like this one. At the beginning of October, three boats sank, including one with 500 people on board. In two years, 3,600 illegal immigrants have supposedly died at sea. The risk is huge, but the promise of a better life in Europe is stronger than anything else. Two days later, the long-awaited moment arrives. They're summoned without luggage to a beach north of Zawara. Emil, like the others, holds his breath. Any sound could mean patrolling police. After waiting for an hour, the signal is given. Get up. Dozens of migrants take the little smugglers' boats by storm. A few minutes later, they urge them to climb on board a much bigger boat. The migrants can't see anything. They don't know how many there are. One thing is certain. Now, they are left to their own devices. We're scared and we don't know if the captain is competent. We don't know where he's from or if he's experienced. On the deck, this pregnant woman is already feeling unwell and her journey has not even begun. At 5 a.m., dawn allows them to discover the boat and their companions in misery. In total, there are 260 of them. 
among them Eritreans, Libyans, and Somali. On board, in the face of danger, religious differences dissipate. Everyone relies on their own God. Joseph is looking for Alia and Emil. They were separated upon boarding. I'm looking for a pathway so we can find my two brothers down below. But the front hold is inaccessible. There's no way I can get through. It's too crowded. The place is jammed up, completely packed. However, we managed to go down through the rear hatch. The worst part of the boat. About a hundred migrants are piled on top of each other. There is an unbearable stench and the heat is suffocating. There is no breeze at all. The deafening sound of the engine is headache inducing. It's really awful here, honestly. I can't even breathe properly. I'm really uncomfortable. It's so hot. There's vomit everywhere. People got seasick and had to throw up. And the smell spreads around. I'm so uncomfortable. But I don't have a choice. An hour after departure, smugglers organize a frugal breakfast. Give me the bag. They give out water, bread and cheese. Their faces cheer up. They don't know it yet, but it will be their only meal during the crossing. Those damned to the hold aren't certain to want to eat. From Tripoli to Lampedusa, I paid $1,400 per person. For us, three. For me, my wife and little Aisha. How much did you pay? $1,400. How much did you pay? $1,400. How much? Me too, same as them. The prices of the trip may be different, but they all went bankrupt for the same reason. It's a risk for us. We know it's risky. But if we are all there, it's to finally have something to eat on our plates. For the smugglers, trafficking is very profitable. According to our estimates, the 260 migrants brought in nearly $220,000. And yet on board, not a single life jacket nor distress flare in the event of a shipwreck. To find his way, the captain only has the bare minimum, a compass and a GPS for the general public. We're on the right track thanks to this small GPS and compass. For the time being, everything is fine. Lampedusa is still a long way away. They have 12 hours left to navigate and the worst is yet to come. Hurry up, you are always the last one. For their part, the Afghans. Javed. Fawad. Rahani. And Luckman have made good progress in Iran. They've covered over 3,500 kilometers. They are now in the Iranian region of Fars, in the center of the country. They're exhausted. Ruthless smugglers impose a hellish pace. The faster the group arrives at its destination, the sooner they can go find another one. 
On the seventh day of walking, Luckman starts to break. We've crossed at least 50, 60 mountains, but it's still going. At this stage of walking, their muscles become sore and their joints suffer. Rouhani can't take it anymore. My legs hurt a lot. This place is very difficult. Especially since none of the migrants are really equipped for such a long walk. Many are in dress shoes or low-quality sneakers. Javid, on the other hand, has been suffering for several hours. His Pakistani shoes have fallen apart on the rocks. These are shoes made in Pakistan. His feet are not in better condition. We can't wash, we're very dirty. Look at my socks. Doctor, sir. Have you seen Fawad's foot? Have you seen his blister? These challenges don't prevent solidarity among the walkers. For the past hour, this old man has been in agony with every step. Javed is the one taking care of him. Did you fall? Yes. Does it hurt? Yes, it hurts a lot. Anticipating something like this, Javid packed a small first aid kit. Tighten the bandage more. It will be more effective. Can you walk, Baba? Yes. Someone should stay by his side. After fatigue, the other enemy is dehydration. We are thirsty, so thirsty. Everyone carries a bottle, but when it's empty, the Afghans depend on the water holes they come across randomly during the walk. Most of the time, it's dirty water. But they don't hesitate to plunge their bottle into it at the risk of getting sick. Are you thirsty? Yes, I am very thirsty, but there is no water. Well, there is, but it's dirty, and we need to drink. What does it taste like? It's foul. Javid found a trick that may not be very effective, but simple. He filters the water with his scarf. On the 10th day of the march, the line of 160 migrants stretches out and eventually breaks up. Some are lagging behind, exhausted by fatigue, they can't even keep up with the group anymore. Javid and his comrades collapse. We are tired. We are so tired. People were too far behind. Yes, many of them are lagging behind. A Pakistani man is in really bad shape. If he stays there, do you think he's going to die? Of course he's going to die, and you followed? Are you hiding behind the branches? How are you feeling? I am not feeling good. From Shiraz, the Turkish border is still 1,000 kilometers away, but a surprise awaits them. Some parts of the trip will be done by car. Thirty kilometers here, twenty kilometers there for free. Then, back to the hard effort. I don't understand why did they get us off the truck. They take us elsewhere. Maybe the road is blocked. Since they have been in Iran, they alternate camping in the middle of the mountains, far from the meals promised by the smugglers. Don't eat this bread, it's moldy, you're going to get sick. And the hideouts are not necessarily more comfortable. It's so hot. It's horrible. 
They forced us to go out and stay outside. It's crazy hot. What can we do now? It's so hot. It's killing me. I don't have anything to drink with this cookie, no water. It's stuck in my throat. It's not great. These caches have one advantage. They have electricity, which allows them to charge their cell phones, which is far from being a luxury. Strangely, guides sometimes abandon the migrants by just showing them which direction to follow. When the group gets lost, it's a panic. Like today, Javid, at his wit's end, calls the smuggler. Send someone to us. If no one comes, I'll report you to the police. Screw you. He said he was sending someone to us in 20 minutes. That's what he just told me. He's been saying that for hours. Iranian telecoms are quite efficient. There's signal across all the mountains. Past Tehran, the Iranian capital, they're heading straight for Turkey, crammed into an old Peugeot. Some are even stuffed in the trunk. It's mid-May. They left Afghanistan a month ago, and they are now reaching the mountains of Kurdistan that separate them from Turkey. We meet up with them at this stage and pick up filming where we left off. Here, the landscapes contrast with the bare mountains in central Iran. Here, it's mountain pastures and a cool climate. The smugglers have provided warm clothing for the Afghans. The cookies are no longer moldy. They feel human again. On this day, everyone makes themselves as presentable as possible. In improvised photo shoot, the local smuggler prepared Turkish asylum applications with fake names. All they have to do is stick in the photos. Look, it's funny. Now my name is Haman of Medzai. If there are police checks, thanks to these papers, we will be able to reach Istanbul quietly. Their crossing is scheduled for 10 days' time. Over there is the mountain where we have to cross the border. Behind the mountain ranges of Kurdistan is Turkey, the gateway to Europe. But to reach it, they will have to face the cold and the snow. Third hour of suffering for the 260 African illegal immigrants. At the back of the hold, Emil is not feeling well. Eli, for his part, manages to distance himself from this hill. Joseph made a small place for him next to him. My heart and stomach are buzzing. My heart is doing somersaults. It makes me want to throw up, but I haven't thrown up yet. Everyone has been vomiting for hours, over and over. I haven't vomited yet. I haven't even eaten. I can't swallow anything. Joseph checks that his very special schedule has not been deleted. He put his feet in the water before getting on the boat. Those are the phone numbers I wrote there because the Libyan smugglers took all our phones and SIM cards. I anticipated it. I wrote all the numbers there.
The captain has just announced that we're out of Libyan waters. He just announced 30 seconds ago. Good news? Good news. By Libya. All of a sudden, anything is possible. But there are few boats that go beyond territorial waters. By the fifth hour of crossing, the deafening sound of the engine goes silent. An unsettling odor spreads across the deck. There's a burning smell coming from the engine over there. It's an engine part that caught fire. These things happen. It's a machine. They're going to help out and then we're going to leave. Ellie remains philosophical, unlike the pregnant woman. It's a bad day. If the boat catches fire, we're all going to die. Shut up. Shut up. We're all going to die, I'm telling you. There's no point in panicking. Our lives depend on him. We have to trust him. Half an hour later, the engine starts again. But the incident left a lasting impression. There is now a certain tension on board. This young Libyan can't stand the back and forth between certain passengers. He tries to intimidate them and then gets up, threatening them. On the way back, he almost injures the pregnant passenger. It's because of the people up front. That's enough. If they stand up, they're going to make us capsize. At the 12th hour of sailing, an Italian civil security helicopter flies overhead. At first glance, they will maybe be able to turn their backs on their former lives of misery. Some were civil servants or even military personnel, privileged positions in their country, but allowed them to only just get by. I did not imagine a teacher or a soldier making $7 a month. But what does $7 represent? How can anyone live off $7? What if you give $7 to a Belgian? The home of the European Union HQ which creates all the laws to block immigration, to live on that for a month, what can they do with $7? Informed by civil security, the Italian Navy intervenes. Immediately, the captain of the ship lets go of the boat's wheel. The army takes photos, and if he is identified as such, the penalty is automatic. The captain is protecting himself because if they know he's the captain, he could go to prison. Every time the helicopter passes over, he lets go of the wheel, like anyone is steering it. He's acting like a mere passenger. Twenty minutes later, an Italian military vessel comes to meet them. The migrants are getting upset. They've been sitting and squishing together for over 10 hours. The Libyan with the knife is once again looking for a fight. How many children are there? Three. And pregnant women. Life jackets in case a migrant falls into the water in the stampede. 
Don't worry, there will be one for everyone. There will be one for everyone. Sit down, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Get closer, go on, throw the rope. The transshipment of these Africans will last for hours. The Cameroonians are the last to board. Joseph, Elia, and Emile are breathing. They have defeated the Mediterranean. When they finally reach Lampedusa, 21 hours have passed since they left Libya. Their journey to Paris is far from over. To reach the capital, they will have to escape the island of Lampedusa. It has been 20 years since the island, very close to the Tunisian and Libyan coasts, has been the target of African migrants. In the port, a migrant boat graveyard testifies to the mass arrivals. In 2013, 15,000 people supposedly tried to make it to Lampedusa. The three Cameroonians are taken in in this camp specially built by the Italian state. Designed for 250 people, it accommodates more than a thousand. And in summer, when the sea is calm, the influx of migrants is such that they are forced to sleep outside. Logically, Emile, Joseph, and Elia will have to stay there for at least one year while their asylum application is examined. If it is rejected, they will be sent back to Cameroon. But an unexpected event will change their fate. At the beginning of July, Pope Francis went to Lampedusa to celebrate mass in memory of migrants who died at sea. Before his arrival, part of the camp was emptied to avoid overflows. The Cameroonians and other illegal immigrants were evaluated by plane to Sicily. To another detention camp, Carmenio. A former NATO military housing complex. It is also overcrowded. 4,000 migrants for 1,500 places. The camera is not welcome here. To find Elia, Emil, and Joseph, there is no other option but to enter illegally at night. Once inside, we are welcomed by the head of the Cameroonian community. He shows us around a small town with cyber cafes, grocery stores, and even brothels. Migrants are all in the same boat and yet, nationalities do not mix. Tensions are even frequent between them. The Italian policemen want nothing to do with it. Are there ever policemen patrolling? They patrol, but they don't do their job, they don't perform checks, they don't do anything about fighting. They do absolutely nothing. Each neighborhood is occupied by a community. Robert takes us to the house where the Cameroonians live. Inside, the ambience seems pleasant. There is no furniture, but there is something to drink. This is all I have left. If I couldn't dance, I'd die. Joseph, Emil, and Elia are in bits. They don't share the general enthusiasm. This place is unbearable. There are at least 10 people in houses built for three people. I was sent to a house. It's almost midnight, but people are not sleeping. People are walking everywhere. The house is the shop. It is the bar. This is the house where we sleep. That's it, really. Joseph is outraged. He expected a different welcome. They are only served one meal per day. 
When someone has to eat, is it normal for an immigrant to eat this? If this is how immigrants are treated here in Italy, really it's pathetic. Don't listen to the haters. Listen to your heart instead, yeah. In Cameroon, we like the show. When they are hungry, there is only one solution. Mama Veronique's store. What do you do here? I sell, I get by. So as not to be unemployed, so as not to just do nothing. I keep myself occupied. Mama Veronique does her shopping in the village next door because everyone has the right to leave the camp during the day with the obligation to come back in the evening. I go to buy this stuff. I buy in bulk to get at least a one euro discount per pack. The African people buy. If I don't do that, camp life would force me to prostitute myself. Since I don't want to be a prostitute, I have to do something else to use my time while I wait for my papers. Obtaining a residence permit is far from easy. It is better to come from a country at war or to be persecuted. Otherwise, it's deportation and back to square one. But the examination boards are overwhelmed and the answers sometimes come months or even years later. Usually we have to wait six months until our cases get examined. But he's been waiting two years. That's not normal. He's been waiting for two years and has never been summoned. None of the Cameroonians want to wait that long. They're going to pull an Irish goodbye. I've made up my mind. I'm leaving. Do you understand? I'm leaving too. He too has made up his mind. He is leaving, but it must be done. With all soul and conscience. It is a path of no return that we will take. I can't stay here in this mess. The problem is that residency proceedings have been initiated. I would rather be undocumented all my life than to spend two years in this camp. Maybe this is where I'm going to die, and maybe even become a criminal. I prefer to be outside in the dark rather than staying in this camp. Javid, Luckman and Rahani have been resting in Istanbul for almost a week. Their faces are now relaxed. However, they arrived in poor condition. The passage between Iran and Turkey wasn't much fun. The group of Afghans had to battle with the rain, the snow and the cold. Their next destination? Greece. They're going to get there on board an illegal boat. Before risking their lives at sea, they really take in Istanbul. It's a culture shock. It's the first time these Afghans have seen women who are not covered from head to toe and dare to show off their bodies so much. Did you see? Girls are dressed super light here. At home, women can't dress like that. Because in Afghanistan, we have Sharia law. If the Taliban saw women dressed so lightly, there would be very violent reactions. Javid and Rahani are first and foremost mountain people. Farmers who have never seen the sea. The crossing to the Greek islands is extremely worrying. It's the first time I've seen the sea. It looks very deep. It's terrifying. I am very afraid of water. But tomorrow, we take the boat. We have no choice. There's no other way. On May 22nd, they left Istanbul, hidden in a minivan supplied by the smugglers' network. Direction, Kushidasi, 
a famous seaside resort in Western Turkey. One month after they left Afghanistan, they're getting ready to enter Europe. But this well-oiled plan is going to go wrong. As they make their way on foot to the meeting point with the smuggler, they are surprised by the Turkish police. We meet them just after their stampede. In total, the police arrested 50 illegal immigrants. There are only a dozen left. We're going to stay here until tonight, don't worry. The smuggler was arrested. They are left to their own devices. Panicked, Javid calls the head of the network in Turkey. If we find a taxi, we go back to Istanbul or Kushidasi. Let's go. We'll head to Kushidasi. Then he'll call us back. In Kushidasi, they will be taken on by a new smuggler. Two days later, it's the big crossing. Like the Africans, the Afghans are getting ready to go to sea. This time, the destination is not Italy, but Greece. On the beach, everyone is silent. A silence so deep that you can even hear the mosquitoes. Damn mosquitoes. Now, we are not very far from the Greek border by sea. The border is in the middle of the sea. We are going to cross this stretch in a small boat. There are maybe 35 of us. We're going to meet up on this little boat. It is very dangerous. The signal is given. They board an inflatable boat powered by a simple 15 horsepower engine. The direction is the Greek island of Samos, whose lights can be seen just a mile away. On board, everyone avoids moving. The boat is so small that it could capsize. Because of the weight, water seeps in, but Javid is not panicking. His fear of the sea is no longer an issue. Javid, are you scared? For my part, I am only afraid of one thing, and that is God. Suddenly, they find themselves caught in the Greek Coast Guard headlights. Logically, the police should come to their aid. But that night, they'll show cruelty instead. The Coast Guard takes their engine and pushes them back into Turkish waters. Adrift, they are now at the mercy of a bad wave. The police took the engine and the gas from us, and they abandoned us. Dirty Greeks. They messed up our trip, and what's more, they abandoned us. Without an engine, the boat becomes unstable. Tossed by the waves, the 35 shipwrecked are afraid. The small boat drifts with the currents. Resigned, the illegal immigrants have a smoke. Unlike earlier, they are trying to be seen. <laughs> Lift the lighter so they can see us. At dawn, hope is reborn in the form of a Turkish Coast Guard boat. <laughs> it collects the migrants and brings them back to land. Get on board, one by one. Okay, that's fine. We do it like that. Their lives are saved, but the game is far from over. The Turkish government is not very kind to illegal immigrants. Our three Afghans are at risk of immediate expulsion.
In Sicily, Elia, Emil, and Joseph fled the detention camp without waiting for their residence permit. The consequences are serious. They have lost their refugee status and are now considered as illegal immigrants in Europe. We are waiting for the bus to go to the port, to take a ferry tonight which will take us to Naples tomorrow, we will try tomorrow morning. They have only one idea in mind, to get to the continent, and then Paris, where they have contacts and friends. The only problem is that they don't even have Cameroonian passports. And to buy a boat ticket, the document is mandatory. It's a security measure to prevent illegal immigrants from leaving the island. But there is a flaw in this system. The bus is the only way for us to get to Rome. On the train, boat or plane, you need a passport, which we don't have. With the bus, we just pay for the ticket. So, I'm feeling confident that the police won't stop us. It's a big surprise. The bus gets on the ferry, and now no one asks them for papers. Earlier, we were told that we could not take the boat without a passport. And all of a sudden, I find myself on a bus in the boat. That's surprising, isn't it? To go to Rome, they only have $130 with them. Money raised thanks to a bit of business in the camp and the few dollars sent by their families. The French dream is finally within reach. Between Paris and them, there are only 1,500 kilometers left. In Turkey, the trip to Europe has come to an end for the Afghans. After they were arrested at sea, they were imprisoned. After three weeks, Javid and Rouhani were sent back to Afghanistan. Only two escaped the Turkish authorities. Young Lukman in white and Fawad, the truck driver. At the beginning of July, we meet them again in Istanbul. Fawad and I got away because we said we were 16. So we were sent to a juvenile camp. From there, we escaped and returned to Istanbul. After several failed attempts to get to Greece, the network changes the itinerary. A change of direction that will cost their families $3,800 more. The direction is Sicily. The two Afghans will get there by hiding in a tourist boat. From there, they'll reach Rome. We meet up with them in front of the Colosseum. It's amazing. It's incredible. I've already seen this monument in movies. And I have heard about I've heard of it. It's of course, very, it's very old. From a very long time, maybe it must be at least 1,000 years old. Years ago. Rome, this is where the smuggler's contract ends. Lugman and Fawad must now fend for themselves. Unlike the Africans, they have never been extorted. They have some savings left enough to reach Paris. Two tickets to Ventimiglia. The 3 p.m. train. Two tickets. Yes, two tickets. The three Cameroonians were in the same station two weeks ago, but they had run out of money. We have been following them for almost eight months and relationships have been established. And in the face of their distress, we chose to help them by paying for their train ticket to Paris. On the platform, Emil and his two friends are amazed in front of so much modernity. It's really organized here. Everything is on time. That's why it's hard for us. There are so many people and so many trains. The migrants from Cameroon and Afghanistan ended up making the same trip. 
just a few weeks apart. From Rome to Paris, they took the same trains, admired the same landscapes, slept in the same stations. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Your captains and the TGV team welcome you to your destination in Paris, Gare de Lyon. Dressed like vacationers, the Afghans and Cameroonians did not attract the attention of the police officers during their entire trip. Finally, here we are in Paris. It was our dream. Now we are here. It's amazing. This station is impressive. It's probably the biggest in the world. Now they are going to have to make a new life. And that's where it all gets complicated. Things are not as simple or as obvious as they think. At the beginning, everyone is happy. A childhood friend of Elia, who arrived seven years ago as a student, comes to welcome them. Elia is going to stay with him. It's been a long trip, you can't even imagine. It was so, so long. For Joseph too, everything is going well. Yes, we are in Marcadet now. An old friend is going to take him in. There are all these traffic jams around the city, but it happens. The only one left high and dry is Emile. None of his acquaintances in Paris want to take him in. I'm lost. I'm lost. I know a lot of people here who refuse to see me. I didn't think I'd end up like this since I know people here. Eric, Ellie's friend, tries to find a solution for him, at least for the night. I am in the process of calling a cousin with whom Emile can sleep. For now, Emile can relax. Tonight he will have a roof over his head. But what about tomorrow? When we stopped shooting, Emile, Ellie, and Joseph, the three Cameroonians, were no longer hosted by anyone. Luckman and Fawad, for their part, went to the only address that they know, a Parisian square well known to their compatriots. There will be plenty of Afghans here. We are going to find people we know and maybe even our family. <laughs> They too, like the Africans, quickly became disillusioned. The life of refugees in Paris is far from what they imagined. There is no work and no one to help them. Luckily, their new friend explains to them how to survive in the Parisian jungle. If you want to eat, you have to go around the mosques. You do your ablutions, your three prayers, you will have a good meal. In the morning, when this park opens, what do you think we do? You get yourself a rug and boxes. And you're going to put them here, your bag will be your pillow, and you'll sleep just not to think about it. You never know where you're going to eat the next day. Our situation is so bad. I've been here for two years, and I haven't sent a cent back to the country yet. I was told that in Paris, helicopters sprayed perfume over the city. But as soon as I got here, I understood that it was worse than Jalalabad, my hometown in Afghanistan. I never thought it was like this. I was told that when I arrived, I'd find everything at the Gare de l'Est. And then I see people who are much unhappier than me. So what do I do? Do I stay or go back? At night, the square closes its doors. Luckman and Fawad share the fate of Afghans in Paris. 
When I arrived in Paris, I thought the government was going to help us. When I came here and I saw Afghan people... And here I see my Afghan brothers sleeping on the street. Uh, I'm, I, my dream was just... My dream is totally shattered. Broke. Four months after leaving Pakistan, Lukman wanders around Paris going between shelters and the street. But he is learning French in an association. Scandalized, Fawad preferred to try his luck in Germany. There, he was taken in for questioning. He is currently waiting for the German justice to decide his fate. <laughs> 